Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third and for this academic year, the final instalment of our Diverse Libraries webinar series. Uh, my name is Lucy Starbuck Bradley, and I am Senior Program Manager for Reading for Enjoyment at the National Literacy Trust. Um, I know many of you will be familiar with us. Um, the National Literacy Trust is an independent charity um, that works with schools and communities to give disadvantaged children the literacy skills they need to succeed in life. And um, we have around 15 regional literacy hubs, we have campaigns, and we also work with a network of schools um, to develop approaches that work for the communities that we're based in. And that means that we need to engage in a constant process of reflection and development and adjustment around our equality, diversity and inclusion practices. And that really underpins all of the work that we do. And it's why we're so passionate about um, diversity. Uh, for this series of webinars, we've joined up with our longstanding partners, leading children's publisher Puffin, and also with Libraries Connected, um, an organisation that promotes the public uh, promotes the value of public libraries and supports innovation across the sector in England, Wales and in Northern Ireland. And I know that many of people in this virtual room today are from the public library sector and you've come to us through your connection with Libraries Connected, so welcome. And we also have in the virtual room um, school librarians and educators and we're really thrilled to have that exciting mix of professionals um, together today um, and we're using Arts Council England funding in order to, to put this uh, opportunity on so thank you also to the Arts Council. Um, we know many of you joined us for our first two webinars. We had one back in December last year and also one in March this year. But if you didn't manage to catch um, those webinars, don't worry, you can watch the recordings on the National Literacy Trust website and I can see that Mike has put the link into the chat already. Thank you, Mike. Um, for those webinars, we focused on sharing information to support you in diversifying your book stock in the first webinar. And then also you had a really deep dive into approaches to promoting anti-racism through your work in libraries, which was a really valuable session I know many of you found. Um, so if you haven't seen them, do go and check them out. And we have a really fantastic lineup of speakers today who I'm gonna to introduce to you in due course. Um, the focus of today's webinar is diversity beyond the bookshelf. And we're set to explore a range of ways that libraries and schools have used their unique positions within communities to bring people together, um, to support conversations and to build connections between a diverse range of community members. Um, so in the process of this webinar, we hope to give you some ideas um, and also to stimulate uh, productive conversation between you all in that chat. So um, as well as learning from our guest speakers, we really want to hear um, about the exciting and innovative approaches you've used to community engagement in your own libraries and classrooms. Um, and so that we can all benefit from the level of expertise that's in this virtual room today. So please do get involved in that chat throughout the session. Um, as well as the chat, we've also down the bottom there, you've got your Q and A function. Um, at the end of each speaker's presentation, um, I'll be coming back to field some questions from all of you. So whilst those presentations go on, please do use that question and answer function to submit any questions. It's much harder for us to sort of find them out in the chat. So please use that Q and A function there to, to put your questions in. Um, I'll do my best to ask them all, um, but if due to time restrictions I can't, then um, I'll, I'll try and bring up all of the main themes that are covered in people's individual questions so that we've at least touched on the themes um, that, that you're looking to explore. So um, it's time to get started. Um, our first speaker is Jessica Takeon, who's a Deputy Head of English at City of London Academy. And Jess also leads the Right Writing Campaign that you can check out on Twitter, um, which is a campaign demanding that AQA add greater representation to their English literature GCSE texts, particularly with regards to writers of colour. Um, and Jess is here today to speak to us about the impact of a book club that she's run with her pupils um, at school. Um, if you do have any questions for, for Jess, put them in that Q&A box. Um, Jess, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And we're really looking forward to hearing about your experiences. Thank you, Lucy. Hi, everyone. Um, and yeah, as Lucy said, thank you for um, taking the time to join today. Um, so just to give a bit of, I guess, background and rationale for this um, reading club that I set up. Um, Sorry, let me just put that on. Um, so it was with year nine um, and to just give a bit of background about um, my school. So I work in a mainstream academy in a very 
um, diverse area of North London and we have one of the highest percentages of pupil premium students in the country. Um, at the time of me starting this reading club with year nine, um, we were an all white English department. So on the most basic level, um, I created this, this reading club to allow students to feel more represented in literature and to feel more engaged, but also to give up some of my power um, as a white person in a space discussing a subject that, as we all know, has historically excluded or misrepresented people of colour. Um, but it also allowed me to give up a bit of my power just as a teacher and create a more equal, um, I guess, comfortable but challenging space in a way. Um, and I prioritised making sure that all of this was embedded um, in the non-negotiables that I had for the group um, when I set it up and also going forward. Um, so it doesn't seem to be changing the slide for me if someone else could do that for me. There you go. As well. Thank you. Um, so these, before I set up the reading club, these were the non-negotiables that I had and these stayed throughout the the duration that I, I ran the club. Um, so every session was focused around one skill that um, was key to succeeding in the English literature GCSE. Um, I didn't share this with students uh, because I wanted it to be very much um, a reading for pleasure initiative, if you will. And so I didn't want students to feel like they were being tested or anything. It was more just that um, I wanted to be able to show the value of this this reading group through multiple different lenses in a way. Um, every session is discussion based. So there was very little, if any, writing that we did. Um, the approach to every session was based around at least one piece of educational research. Um, if there's a misunderstanding or an important question that comes up, which derails the discussion we're having, then this is, this is celebrated. It's not seen as a disruption. Um, people in the group are referred to as members, not students, because like I said earlier, I wanted it to feel very um, equal. So I was more there as a facilitator rather than a teacher. Um, I was really strict that the group couldn't exceed eight members. I think we were six was the largest the group got. Um, no one would be interrupted. Um, so as I said, I wanted it to be a really safe space. Uh, mutual respect for all members will be upheld at all times. Individual groups can come up with specific rules surrounding this, which we did. Um, and I made sure that the group always sat in a circle formation as well. Um, so the classroom that I was in, it was it was in rows and I didn't make them, you know, sit around like in circle time on the carpet because they were year nines. Um, but I made sure that we were facing each other. So it felt like a conversation. Um, I could also, obviously doing this, I could stand on the shoulders of so much important work in the realms of diver diversity in literature and English teaching. So um, like the Penguin Lit and Colour Research, which found that um, fewer than 1% of students at GCSE have studied a book by a writer of colour. Um, research, which also goes into great detail about the benefits of a diverse curriculum as well, which are endless. Um, obviously creating a sense of belonging and celebration for all students, including white students. Um, in our first session in the reading group, I showed students these rules or these non-negotiables. Um, I explained my thinking behind them, like I've just done now. Um, and then we created our rules as a group. Um, so obviously individual teachers could set up the rules that they want to have for their um, individual groups that they wanted to create. Um, so to give an example um, of what one of the sessions, one of the early sessions looked like, um, initially we looked at extracts and so we read extracts from different books to get just more comfortable with each other because these weren't students who were friends, they weren't in the same classes, a lot of them. Um, and also obviously to open ourselves up to different texts, writers and text types and themes. Um, so this was one of the, the earliest ones. So the rationale behind this session was that 15% of marks available in the English literature GCSD are for AO3, which is about linking text to the context they're written. So this session was all about contextualization. Um, and then the research that was sort of the rationale behind this session was that often context is taught as um, like a separate topic from the book or it's, it's a bolt on when in reality it should come from the text. It should be elicited from the text um, to ensure that obviously the knowledge they have of that context is holistic and it's um, 
it's relatable. I won't read this because um, we don't have time, but this is the extract we looked at. So this is from um, True Love by Sarah E. Farrow, um, which is a 19th century text. And it was one of the, um, that we know of, one of the first novels ever published by an African-American writer. So this is what we did in the session. So we read the text as a group with no sort of background at all. That was our first reading. Our second reading was to highlight anything which showed something about attitudes towards healthcare. Our third reading was to discuss what we could tell about attitudes to healthcare in the UK in the 1800s from the text. Um, and then we went around in a circle and we had a more in-depth discussion about this. And I created a class agenda. Um, and in case anyone's never done this in the classroom before, it's lit a agenda is literally where you, you write down the conversation. So it's sort of like a mind map, but you make connections between different parts of the conversation and you think oh we came back to that and that links to what so and so said earlier and it works really well just to be able to sit back afterwards and look at what's been discussed otherwise I think sometimes ideas could get lost I suppose um, and then as I said after we'd read the text and we discussed it we then looked at the contextual background um, so this is the information I gave them so Sarah E. Farrow was one of only a handful of African-Americans to publish a novel in the 19th century. Um, we now know that she was actually the first ever. For a long time, her novel, True Love, a story of English domestic life, disappeared from historical records, which is one of the reasons the story is so interesting, because it's fairly recently been sort of discovered. Um, and then to finish off the session, we spoke about why we thought Farrow had included this scene. And then on the back of their extracts, um, they wrote a sentence just to contextualise in their idea, um, thinking about what they now know of the background of the book. Um, so after the first few sessions, we um, voted on a book to read together. Um, um, so these are the books that I remember being included in the vote, but I think there might have been more. Um, when choosing what to read, especially in terms of reading for pleasure situations like this one, um, there's no need for teachers to spend hours reading the text that they potentially want to read with students. There's so many recommendation lists that already exist. Um, I can think of Teach First has a missing pages library of lots of different, a really diverse range of texts. Obviously, um, Lit in Colour, Penguin's Lit in Colour um, pages have so many recommendations. I know the National Literacy Trust has um, text recommendation lists as well. Um, and also just ask students and trust them um, to give recommendations. Um, I also gave students the opportunity to um, choose a book that we could vote on as well. So I gave them a week and I said, you know, in our next session, we're going to vote on the text that we're going to read together. So these are my suggestions. If you have any others, please let me know. Um, when So we voted on Clap When You Land. Um, and when we started reading that book, I'd never read it before. Obviously, I'd done a bit of research to check that it was appropriate and um, everything else and to check that what if any sort of difficult themes came up just so I could warn students ahead of time. Um, but it was great to learn alongside the students and be able to ask them questions as we read. Um, and equally, if we'd have started reading Clap When You Land and they hated it, um, it can be really empowering for students to actually um, be able to say that and make that choice to change their mind. And as a group, as a team, we could have decided to switch. Um, so these are just some quotes from a couple of students who are now in year 10. So I asked them for these quotes in the past week, um, but they did. They were part of this club last year when they were in year nine. And this is what they said. Um, I really enjoyed the enrichment, which is what we call clubs in our school. So I really enjoyed the enrichment as it allowed me to explore people's opinions of the same book that I'm reading. It was also more of a chill environment as Miss never made us put our hands up and debates were always allowed. I also enjoyed reading at the same pace as everyone because seeing people's reactions at certain times during the book was really interesting. Unfortunately, we never got to finish the book as our time together as a group was up. But I did take the initiative to read to finish the book myself in my spare time. Overall, I really like the enrichment as it helped me gain a wider knowledge of how books aren't that boring and more interesting with a backstory or based off a true story. So Clap When You Land was based off of um, a plane crash in the Dominican Republic. 
Um, I found it therapeutic because it's nice listening to people read and it's even nicer when it's in a small group because there's not the pressure of a larger group. Different year groups would have been nice because it would introduce us to different pupils. Experiencing something together is better than experiencing it alone. Um, and I think it was a very positive experience for students. These were students that I knew reasonably well. Um, I taught all of them at least once, I think. Um, and seeing how much more they opened up in this group when, as the first student put, it was a bit more chill. It, they obviously had those ideas within them and those opinions within them. They just, this gave them um, the opportunity to feel like they could share those things because often um, the discussion, it, it did derail from the book. And in some sessions we didn't get a lot of reading done, but we had these amazing discussions um, often quite difficult discussions that I hadn't um, I hadn't prepared for, but it was it was really valuable, and I I truly believe that it was a safe space for pupils, and that they felt safe um, that they weren't going to be offended, I guess, but also safe to to challenge others and to challenge ideas. Um, and I know I'm, I'm probably running out of time, um, but before I finish, I just want to say something that is is potentially obvious. Obviously the teaching of English, um, reading, reading in schools, it's very complicated, it's very subjective um, and it changes so much depending on the context that you're in. So as Lucy said, I know we've got school librarians here, teachers here, public um, librarians. So what I'm saying, what I did here, it may not um, always be 100% the appropriate way to do things in any given situation. Um, but it was very valuable for me and I learned a lot from running this, this reading club. Um, and it seems like it was, it was useful for students as well. Um, so I hope that it's given an insight into just one way that we can approach diversity in reading in schools beyond just, you know, beyond the bookshelf, I guess, which is the title of this webinar. Um, thank you. And if anyone does have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or Q&A. Uh, thanks so much, Jess. That's really, really interesting. Um, you spoke a lot about equality and empowerment in your presentation um, and about the shift in sort of student teacher dynamic. Um, I've got a question coming up from some people that people have put in the Q&A, but one from me to start. Um, I wonder to what extent you felt that that this power shift was um, sort of key to the group's success. That's sort of the first part. And the second part of the question was, has that um, filtered out into your wider approach to sort of pedagogy or curriculum design across your department? I think that equality was, um, was really important because it, like I said, it just made students feel more open to say what, what they actually thought. So for example, there was one session where, um, so I'm not sure if anyone's read Clap When You Land, um, but one of the protagonists is gay and um, we, we were reading a scene where that was first introduced and a girl in the group who is from the Caribbean, she said, sort of under her breath, she said, oh, I thought she was my girl. And I, I questioned her on it and I said, oh, what, what do you mean? And it transpired that she... Um, she didn't believe that being homosexual was right. So it was quite, um, it was a difficult conversation to have because I wanted her to feel safe to say what she thought, um, but obviously to challenge her at the same time. And I think that was quite far in to us doing the reading club. And I think um, she obviously felt safe to voice that. And it wasn't after she said that she didn't sort of, curl up in a way and then you know go into herself she did explain why she thought that and we in a supportive way challenged her um, as a group and it, it was actually a really productive conversation um, it wasn't a case of me being the teacher standing up at the front saying no you're wrong because of xyz let's move on it was that became the session that discussion um, and it was it felt nice it didn't feel um like she the people had said something and that it was really awkward and 
and no one knew what to say. It just felt like, okay, this has been said, let's discuss this. Let's, let's unpack that a little bit. And I think those non-negotiables were really important for creating that, that sort of culture and that sort of climate. Um, and in terms of wider teaching, definitely, um, definitely, definitely. I think since um, sort of seeing the success of this, this club and it wasn't anything groundbreaking, you know, just sort of giving up a little bit of your power as a teacher. Um, but since doing that, I've planned, I've made an effort to plan into our curriculum and into our schemes of work, lots of opportunities for students to take charge um, and for teachers to learn from students. So whether that be literally saying in the lesson plan, um, I don't know, for example, in year seven, we do a scheme of work called Writing Resilience. And the main text is I am Malala, but it's all about different texts to do resilience. And I planned into that scheme of work, give students the opportunity to find their own extracts or stories that are about resilience and share them with the class. So it's just little things like that, I think, make students feel like they have agency in what they're learning. Um, particularly in a subject like English, which I think, as I sort of said at the start, it can feel very elitist and like separate from students and their world. So anything we can do to make them feel like they matter, <laughs> that they're more involved, I think is, is a positive. Really important, as you say, to create a safe space whereby it links uh, actually to some of the points in the second webinar um, a few months ago where Tiffany Jewell was saying about um, way in which we conduct conversations to allow people to express their opinions and it gives an opportunity to then sort of address prejudice where it's maybe not always on the surface. So that's really, really valuable. Um, we've got a few questions here um, around the kind of practicalities. Obviously, people are really interested in, in the way in which the group was run. So Nicole's asking, how were the members chosen? Did they volunteer or were they selected? Um, and then also uh, Julie asking how many sessions the group had and what was the kind of structure of, uh, and frequency? Um, that's a really good question, actually. They, it was sort of half and half. So the way that um, clubs work in my school is that they sign up for enrichments. So all students would have done an enrichment. So it's likely that they signed up for that enrichment, but also some of them might have just been put in there, if that makes sense, if that wasn't their first choice. Um, so the answer is, I don't know. I imagine it was a bit of a mixture. I know that some of them had chosen that as their enrichment, um, but some of them potentially didn't. Um, and it was over a whole year. So they had it every week for a whole year. Um, and like um, one of the students said, we didn't finish the book, which tells you how much we were just talking about different things, which, you know, is often the case. And as I said at the start, that's I wanted to celebrate that. I didn't want it to feel restrictive. Um, and just one more, but I know we, we're a little bit tight on time today, but another one um, from Donna here is asking, um, did the students what was the impression? Did the children, did the students enjoy the book that they chose? You, you spoke about um, the opportunity for that empowerment if they didn't didn't like the book. But what was the general impression of, of the sort of experience? Do you think of reading? They didn't like it. As, as I said earlier, I, I made it really explicit to them like if we're not enjoying this, we we can change this. This is completely up to all of you. And it's interesting actually. The first student who said she went away and read it herself, she said at one point to me she didn't like it and she wasn't enjoying it. And I said to her, we, we can discuss changing this book um, if you're really not enjoying it. And she said, oh no, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give it a chance. Um, so I don't know what made her wanna give it a chance, but yeah. That's really, really interesting. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we are going to move on, but um, I think that's been a really valuable contribution and so interesting to hear about ways in which um, in a school setting we can shift the, sort of, the power dynamic uh, and the benefits that that can have. So thank you. Um, uh, now it's time for our second speaker today. Um, we are joined by Nabila Hafiz, who's a project manager from the National Literacy Trust in Bradford. Um, and Nabila's here today to talk to us about some innovative community events that the team have hosted in Bradford and their impact. Hi, Nabila. Hi, yeah, thank you for that. I hope I haven't got an echo. Do let me know if you struggle to hear me. Um, 
So just a bit of background on the work of the Bradford Hub. So we have been set up since 2014, supporting literacy across Bradford. We have a lot of unique, innovative projects, focusing on things like poetry, working with fathers' engagement, working with our strategic partners, such as Bradford 2025, um, working with literacy as well as cultural projects and art project, uh, projects, festivals. We've had the Bradford Stories Festival and also Mother Tongue Festival, which is one we've been running for a few years now. Um, we have worked with over 50,000 families, uh, schools, uh, children, and also have been lucky enough to gift over 100,000 books uh, to children across Bradford, which is a, a real um, delight for us to be able to do. Um, I'm going to try going on to the next slide. <laughs> There we go. Uh, so in 2019, we set up the Bradford Stories Festival, which was my first project. Uh, we worked with 12 different schools and many different community groups, uh, bringing together different people from diverse communities across Bradford into sharing their experiences to curate and uh, to collect uh, a festival together ones that they were able to do themselves um, and it was uh, incredible. Uh, we launched with over 150 different people attending, 150 different children, uh, schools members attending. Um, it's not going on to the next slide, I might just give it a second. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and the wider community coming together and celebrating that launch. Uh, we were celebrating different uh, backgrounds, values and cultures of Bradford and creating those shared experiences, which are really important to us in boosting literacy skills for children. Um, the Living Library was a part of the Bradford Stories Festival, um, where the books are in fact real people, the stories are from personal experiences, um, giving the visitors a chance to meet inspiring community members. Um, some of our Living Library uh, individuals for the first one included Ambrin Sadiq, which was one of the first female Asian Muslim boxers. Uh, we had Bishop of Bradford, Toby Howarth, um, and we had the founder of Salah Sengam and also a dancer, Dr. Gita, a great friend of ours. Um, the Bradford Stories Festival worked really closely with these 12 schools over the course of the year. Um, thank you. Um, it was originally inspired by the Danish Human Library Project, uh, which was set up in 2020, and from a touring event that I attended in my youth organised by Bradford Libraries, and in fact it was also set up by my dad, so I got to attend when I was probably around 11 or 12 years old, um, engaging with these people who were the books, um, and I found it fascinating and it lived on in my memory, so being um, that young and attending this event where I got to learn that people each have valuable stories um, and it's not just by picking up a book that we get to learn these stories but we can actually ask these stories from individuals by being curious um, by finding that our neighbors our grandparents and every individual around us comes with unique stories it was a really valuable thing that um, I was given as a young person and it was fresh in my mind even as a project manager uh, so being able to set up the living library from that was uh, really it was incredible it was it was a full circle for me. Um, it is designed to host very personal conversations that challenge stigma and stereotypes. Um, the purpose is to create an environment where children and and adults as well are engaging in stories that are very personal, but also that are against the grain. So um, people who may feel misrepresented or underrepresented get to feel an ownership of their own stories. Um, so we build those diverse representative, representative stories and a focus is on communities for us. Um, we give young people for the Living Library access to those stories, direct access in a very immersive and engaging way uh, and in a very interactive way. Um, and that is through storytelling uh, in, in the most beautiful way around a table where children uh, can approach a person and ask them uh, uh, the questions um, that they need to do to unpick each individual story um, and inspiring the younger generations then to share their own stories. So learning that story is coming in many forms allows 
allows young people to then understand that those stories are also for them to share. Um, the great thing is that from the festival, uh, we were able to then engage the Living Library um, across those schools and communities for all different age groups and audiences. Uh, uh, some great feedback was that schools and young people were recreating the Living Library in their own spaces. Um, community groups were recreating the Living Library to bridge the intergenerational gaps that there were, um, the cultural gaps that there were, and that was a uh, fantastic feedback for us. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm actually going to go into some examples of the Living Library now, um, and this is something we did to really uh, adapt the Living Library into a way that uh, focused on a younger audience, um, and by that we did some prompts, some really lovely prompts by capturing these stories um, and allowing children, almost like having small library cards and little prompt cards, they were able to uh, enter in a space which was really immersive and uh, recreated the essence of what a library means and what books mean. Um, so that's what we tried to do. Uh, the first one being uh, Zaman Akbari, who's uh, a great friend of ours and uh, originally from Afghanistan, a young refugee uh, who fled the war, who was displaced from his family, um, entering a new city um, and really beautifully talking about his love for his pets that he left behind. So creating this dynamic of sadness and grief, but also uh, this connection to young people through uh, something as simple as uh, his pets um, and then learning his talent in basketball so being a basketball coach and then demonstrating that for the young people uh, so that was uh, Zaman's living library uh, prompt card there uh, next one the late Rudy Lever, an incredible, incredible community member, someone who has worked with us closely, who grew up in uh, Germany, uh, escaped Nazi Germany uh, as a young person, uh, found himself then in Bradford, becoming uh, trained and qualified as a dentist. Um, uh, Rudy Lever was the chairman of the Bradford Reform Synagogue, uh, working very closely in interfaith communities. Um, and the most beautiful thing is um, that the close links to the Muslim community was uh, a really, really powerful thing in this story where the Muslim community raised money to essentially save uh, that grade two listed Bradford Reform Synagogue uh, and had it restored, which is a, a lovely story that he was able to share. Rudy actually shared one of his hymns for us, which is a lovely way to engage the young people in a very interactive way. Um, and that was beautiful, uh, bridging those gaps and bridging um, those cultures uh, and those faiths, which is really lovely for us. Next one. Then Ambreen Sadiq, who's one of the first Muslim Asian female boxers, who spoke a lot about empowerment for her as a young female, um, counteracting her bullies and people who doubted her, um, and also being shortlisted for Junior Personality of the Year at British Sports Awards, um, and all the achievement that she's had, which was really an incredible way to engage the young people, but also demonstrating the boxing for them uh, was another really fun and interactive way for us to get the young people to open up to these stories. Next one. And uh, Reverend Dr. Toby Howarth, Bishop of Bradford, who has incredible experiences across different lands. So uh, teaching Afghan refugees in Pakistan, uh, training in India, being born in Kenya. Um, it's a great way to show that people come from so many different places. People are formed from so many different journeys and languages. Um, and that was a really beautiful way to bring in uh, Reverend Tony, Toby Howarth's uh, story into the Living Library. Um, and also a very incredible uh, member of Bradford Interfaith Communities. Uh, so these were the uh, cards that we had. So each child had a, a mini library card, um, almost mocking what a, a library and book should be. And then also these uh, for them to take away, but to engage children that they can um, also be encouraged to ask these questions and not to be shy. Um, so Zaman's here was saying, ask me about growing up in Afghanistan, the achievements I'm most proud of and how I made it as a basketball coach. Uh, so a really great learning activity for the children that the teachers were able to then take away. Next slide. And then the last example here I've got is of uh, Rudy um, and asking about growing up in Nazi Germany and being a refugee uh, and also about reforming, uh, restoring the reform synagogue. Thank you. And these are some of the images from the Living Library that we did. So we've got Dr. Uh, Reverend Toby Howarth. We have 
uh, Rudy Lever there. We have Moses on the drums with the young people and we have our CEO joining in there with the demonstrations of boxing and uh, he was engaging with Ambreen's story, which is really lovely for us. So it's for young and for old. And this is a little bit about the future of where we see the Living Library. The great thing about the Living Library is it's adaptable. So not only can you engage with these stories digitally, uh, which we had to do over COVID, so capturing some of these stories online, um, the, the, also, the other great thing is that we can take these stories out to the people. So for us, we are now looking at doing my Bradford stories um, and using the Living Library and taking that to the heart of communities by the Bradford Stories bus. Uh, so getting some inspiring uh, human and living books, um, popping them onto the bus and taking them into the heart of communities for children and for families to engage in so that they can ask those questions and they can have the stories around them representing different backgrounds, different languages, different journeys uh, and feeling empowered by them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Navila. It's oh, I find it um, really thought provoking thinking about all of the powerful stories that are just living within people that we're surrounded by all day, and um, perhaps we we haven't yet discovered uh, the stories of those that, are, that that we come into contact with. So it's really really fascinating and great to hear the impact that the, the Bradford team is having um, within the communities there. I really, really, really want to go to a living library, so please <laughs> invite me. I'll, I'll just invite myself. Um, <laughs> um, if you have got a question for Namila, do put it into the, the Q&A. Um, uh, one of the things we, I did really want to raise with you, um, you talked a lot about the interfaith community um, and actually um, one of the concerns um, raised by a participant of one of our earlier webinars was around um, the problem for anti-Semitism uh, that's, that's on the rise in the UK, um, and they were they raised concerns um, that there weren't enough um, of a there wasn't enough of a rich pool of texts to draw on from a librarian perspective that that really celebrated Jewish life in this country, um, and so I wondered. Um, in what ways you felt that these kind of events could maybe support developing um, the community's understanding of different religions and promoting community cohesion? Yeah, absolutely. I think the beautiful example there of Rudy, of Zaman, of uh, uh, Reverend Toby and Ambreen is that these stories are there to combat stigma, to combat stereotypes, to allow an ownership of stories, but also allow a very beautiful connection because these stories are all done in person. There's a real vulnerability to that and a real openness. Um, and children in particular have responded beautifully to it. So seeing children join in with some of those hymns from uh, uh, Rudy Lever and having them all interact in a very open way and in a very honest way in a space which is built for curiosity I think that is really the key for breaking down those barriers and knowing that the living library it's not just a fun way to say humans are all books but it is actually a very powerful way to draw connectivity between humans and to draw connectivity as individuals with the stories that live within us um, and we've seen that um, and we've seen how they have broken down those barriers and the great thing is that there is a real um uh, there's a there's a real connectivity in the journeys as you know with uh, Rudy Lever and the synagogue the Muslim community were able to raise money uh, to save the synagogue and some of the children didn't know about that story so sharing that with the young people really it, it allows the next generation to be enriched with these beautifully powerful stories um, and knowing that humans are all connected in a, in a very very beautiful way um, and in a, in a very unified way so there was a lot of solidarity and empowerment uh, in having someone like Rudy Ozaman um, uh, um, and the ownership that they had over their own stories, but also being able to bridge those gaps with the children and being able to break down any stereotypes and stigmas that might exist. Yeah, so it's a experience, especially I think um, thinking about how this, how people who are uh, watching this webinar today um, could start to put this into practice in their own communities, especially mm -hmm. post pandemic, where perhaps we've been, well, we definitely have been in our. Yeah. 
bubbles um not interacting as much with each other yeah yeah i will i will um, add to that that the, uh, a great thing is that if there are communities that feel like there isn't as representation out there the representation through the living library uh it is is wonderful because you can you can access that immediately uh so one of the newer communities with the gypsy traveler community who we're working with uh feel as if there's not enough representation in books and texts for them uh so engaging with the living library is another way to be able to bring that to audiences yeah, fantastic. Um, and what's your observation of children's in, children within these sessions? Um, what kind of experience is it for them? What do you think they get get from from visiting the library? I think it's it's definitely a new experience to be able to formulate in their mind that people are books um, and for them to go into it in a very open way, but also in a very interactive way. So being able to join in, uh, really engaging with that curiosity, seeing that there were elements of the young people where they were shocked, but also to to know that they were really open and joining in every single element. Uh, so joining in the interactive uh, parts of it, joining in more of the storytelling parts of it asking those questions and being curious uh, but then taking that and, and adapting that for themselves which is really really fascinating uh, so being able to for example use it in uh, breaking down intergenerational gaps so you know young people going home and asking their grandparents uh, and, and saying grandparent to their grandparents as as the living books uh, um, you know and prompting those stories uh, but also at school with their teachers with their peers um, and that was wonderful to to hear feedback that they were able to adapt it and do you think that the, the, the living books themselves have um, got, got growth from the experience as well? Did, did it affect them in ways that maybe they didn't expect? Yeah, absolutely. I know um, one of the one of the feedback from Reverend uh, uh, Toby was that he'd never really engaged with young people in this way before as a book. Um, so having this story kind of laid out like that was very interesting for them and seeing children engage with it in that way was also really powerful. So I know the feedback from the volunteers and the books is that they are really privileged to be able to do that and they feel very lucky to be able to share their story in that way and I think that most people didn't expect the reaction that they would get um, so sometimes you holding your story to yourself it might not seem that special but sharing it you you realize that in fact there are so many other people who may relate to it um, and young people who may see that as fascinating and knowing that you are able to break down these barriers and create these spaces for young people is actually a very powerful thing that we all hold yeah, 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 it's right. You you would, um, yeah, we're used to our own stories. Maybe we yeah. don't value our own stories as much. Um, Donna's just asked a question in the uh, in the Q and A around how long children spent with each person as they as they went around. Did they get long to develop those kind of relationships, or was it a bit more of a speed reading session? So for for uh, our living library, we gave uh, we we tried to keep it as intimate as possible. So giving each smaller group about an hour to interact, um, and that was. Uh, uh, so the living library or the living book themselves got at least 15, 20 minutes to share their story, to get the young people to ask those questions, but also to get them to join in things like the hymn, the boxing, the basketball, um, and elements of the kind of more interactive and engaging parts of that storytelling. Um, so I think it, it depends on how, as an individual, you might want to adapt the living library, but for us having that space to really develop the story, creating that intimate space was really important for us and allowing the children to really feel comfortable in using those prompts as well, because it was a younger audience. Uh, we felt like they just needed that time. Yeah, and it sounds like that's really quality interactions as well from it. So yeah, yeah, sounds excellent. Well, thank you so much. We are going to move on now. But um, if anyone has questions for Nabila, you can still pop them in the Q and A. And and while she's here for a little while, um, uh, she should be able to access them from there. Um, but thank you, Nabila. And I'm now going to welcome Sarah Mears. Um, Sarah is a librarian and a program manager for Libraries Connected. Um, uh, she's also co-founder of Empathy Lab, which is what she's come to speak to us about today, which is a not-for-profit organisation which works with schools, libraries, authors and illustrators to build children's empathy skills through the use of creative, liter creative use of literature. Um, she's also was awarded the MBA for services to children and young people in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2018 <laughs> and um, is uh, well known. I'm sure many of you will have heard of Empathy Lab because it's just growing year on year. Um, but today, uh, Sarah, you're specifically going to talk to us about um, social action and, and, uh, and empathy, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Thanks, Lucy. I'll give you to it. Thank you. I'll see if I can move my slide on. 
I said, oh, yeah, it works, works. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And thank you for inviting me today. So uh, as, uh, as Lucy said, Empathy for the Lab is a not-for-profit social enterprise. And we started in 2015. The lab bit of our name is deliberate because we're testing things out oh, as we go along. But I think we were really interested when we started out in the importance of social and emotional skills. And there's been loads of research and it's growing all the time in terms of why these social and emotional skills are important not just for academic attainment, but for you know, your whole life really, in terms of for employment, for relationships. Just think about it, if you can't see other people's points of view, you, you could be a nightmare to matter. So these empathy skills and social emotional skills particularly really, really matter. And I think empathy and relationship skills are the key standouts for these. Um, so we really want to, to be a part of a national debate about how we can build a more empathetic society and an explicit empathy education. We want to inspire young people to consciously build their empathy skills so they'll become those fantastic citizens, workmates, parents. Our work is predicated on three elements. We call it the triple wing framework. So we're uniquely focused around reading for empathy um, and the impact of our empathy work on literacy and reading for pleasure, obviously on empathy skills themselves and well-being and all leading up to pro-social attitudes and social activism. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. We've, uh, we've, settled, on, well, we've settled on four key delivery programmes um, as, as we've developed our lab work. Um, a schools programme, we're just changing the name of that. That will be an affiliate programme for schools rather than just an 18 month programme, but it will run over around two years. Um, and then uh, that's an in-depth program that schools can sign up to. There's also a six month or around about six month program um, and it's focused around four modules, so a modular approach to empathy lab. So that's our school program and then from that they become alumni. We also publish a read for empathy annual book collection. We promote our annual empathy day. We've just we're still recovering from this year's empathy day which was amazing and also there's a lot of innovation with authors and illustrators and publishers um, which I'll talk about in a bit. So this is our Read for Empathy book collection for 2022. There, it's divided into, usually divided into two sections. So a primary section, which includes early years, and a secondary section. So the, this year there were 35 books in the primary collection, 25 in the secondary collection. We also this year piloted a Welsh language collection with books in either uh, just in Welsh or dual language texts as well, because we're doing a lot of work in Wales because of their, their focus on empathy in the curriculum. So there's a lot of definitions of empathy. If you read any book about empathy, you'll get a slightly different definition. We've settled on this one, which is about the ability to experience and understand other people's emotions and crucially about perspectives, which is why I was really interested in the Living Library work, because that's all about perspective taking. And within that, we, we focus in Empathy Lab on four key skills. So just going around them as a clock face, that communication skills, the ability to listen and discuss and communicate with each other is really, really a key part of empathy. For me, the most important part is that stronger ability to imagine and understand other people's perspectives and feelings, but also a wide vocabulary to recognize and share your own and others' feelings. There's a lot of research that says if children can name feelings, they're much better able to cope with them, to manage them, to understand other people. And all of that leads to the more developed pro-social attitudes, which turn those feelings of empathy into moral actions. And most researchers agree that empathetic people are not born. You don't just become either empathetic or not. It's you're very much made and it's all about upbringing. So just 10 percent of our empathy is genetic. The rest is from social factors. So the good news for us is that empathy is a learnable skill and it, we go on learning it through life. So the, a couple of books here that really, really highlight that. So um, in Zero Degrees of Empathy, Simon Baron Cohen, it says that 98% of us can build our empathy skills at any point in our lives and our brains can constantly develop new pathways. And that's good. There's lots of research that shows that if you know that empathy is a learnable skill, you're more likely to be more empathetic, to practice that empathy. So it's really, really important that you recognise that it, it, it's not just who you are. You can change and develop through life. But of course, doing it young is best as with everything. And empathy is made up of three key elements. The first one is the feeling of 
feeling or affective empathy. It's a bit where you really resonate with what other people are feeling. It's a bit, what makes you cry when you're watching someone cry on the television? It's that, you're, it's that affective empathy in action. But you don't just need that. You need also the cognitive or the thinking part of empathy, where you're using, you're putting yourself in someone else's shoes, taking their perspective to understand why someone's upset. What, what they use, we use our reason, we use our imagination to do that. And doing it through the safe distance actually of books is really important. And all of that leads to acting, empathic concern, driving those pro-social attitudes, wanting to help the person who's upset. Um, and all three of them need to work together to make for a really powerful empathy experience. So that's a kind of very, very quick background to, to the theories of empathy. And um, we focus predominantly on reading and empathy because as it says there, stories are a training ground for understanding other people's emotions. We've got a powerful tool in books and book characters to build our empathy skills. So through stories, children learn to understand perspectives that are different from their own. Look at Track Where You Land. In fact, that's told from two different perspectives. It's a brilliant book for really understanding how different people think about the same thing. We can visualise and imagine a story through the eyes of lots of different characters. We can identify emotions and emotional themes. And we can identify both with emotional and experiential journeys of characters and empathise with them. We can make global connections and we can honour difference and celebrate similarities. And I think that thing about global connections is really powerful. I remember a webinar that we had in libraries when during the lockdown with a teacher who said, these children, if they're lucky, they're going from home to school and back again, and that's it. And actually books, are a way of opening their eyes to a wider world that's still out there and helping them understand. So they are a powerful, powerful tool. And I love this. This is Roman Krisnerich's book, Empathy. And, and Roman was one of the first people that we met when we started to really work on Empathy Lab. And he's written a book called Empathy, as it says there, White Matters and How to Get It. And in that book, he talks about empathy being at the heart of storytelling and a fine novelist being an empathy magus who can enable us if only temporarily to shed our skin and step into another way of looking at the world. And I, I should say as well, there was a, um, there's a whole range of research around what happens when we read and, and the empathy that grows when we read. And it's really interesting. And there's a quote from someone called Helen Reese, who says, whilst you may not remember all the details from your favorite stories, you likely do recall the overarching themes of the story because of how the characters and their experiences touched your heart. When you truly connect with a character, it can really shake up your own life. It shakes your expectations. Maybe it forces you to confront prejudice and stereotypes. Again, with listening to, to talking about trap being in land, that sort of happens. It moves you to a better understanding of others. And so when in your own life you encounter an unfamiliar or complicated person who you perhaps you don't understand, you may have a better time relating to them because of the novel, novels and the characters that have helped you practice that empathy skill. And the research confirmed this. Keith Oatley, who's uh, quoted there, he's carried out a number of scientific experiments that shows how reading fiction measurably improves people's empathy, and that's because of the focus on character. So for us, a focus on character is absolutely vital in our work. When we read about characters, our brains are activated almost as if we're involved with people in real life situations. It's quite amazing. Um, the, the research has been replicated at Kingston University in a small scale piece of research with a PhD student who found that people who preferred reading, reading novels were more likely to show positive social behavior and be able to empathize with others. And she thinks, uh, the researcher says, when we read, we go by what is simply written on the page and we have to fill in the gaps as we go along, giving us a chance to develop empathy skills as we really try to understand what the character's going through. And when we watch something on TV, she was comparing it with TV, she said, we have a lot of that information already. So books just really help us increase our pro-social behaviors. Another piece of research that talks about if, if people are really transported into a story, so if it's a brilliant story, they really feel like they're in the story with the characters, they're more likely to show helping behavior after the story, even when all the other variables have been taken into consideration. So you know, how powerful a story can build our pro-social behavior and empathy. 
and characters are so important. And I just picked up some of the characters from some of our Read for Empathy list here uh, that really, really inspire empathy and probably inspire you to take action. So um, it's No Money Day. I think when that was, book was published, it was heart stopping, really. One of the first books we published about poverty and, and food hunger in the UK quite recently. And just uh, on the, our list this year, we've got The Invisible, again, about poverty and, and how you know, ch children and families in poverty almost disappear into communities, they're not noticed. And Race to the Frozen North, which is a true story um, about Matthew Henson, who got to the North Pole, North Pole and actually wasn't celebrated because he happened to be black. You know, it's, it's things like that. And obviously there's books about refugees and their stories, but they're strong characters. And that's what makes us really empathize with, with, the, with the situation. Wonderful books with wonderful characters. So stories inspire people to feel empathy. Empathy improves with practice. We've looked at both of those. So giving them opportunities to take action really helps deepen empathy skills. I love this book. If you haven't read it, I would recommend it. It's, it's an American book and it's got sort of quite American isms in it, if you like, but it's a brilliant read. It's really fascinating by Michelle Borber. And I, I love it because it, she talks about, again, about people who believe that empathy has a potential to grow, more likely to exert it. And she talks about nine habits that um, provide an empathy advantage and how to support children to get those nine habits. And they're things like um, empathetic children keep their cool. They practice kindness. They will stick their necks out. They will want to make a difference. So just using those, using skills that actually support those nine habits is really powerful. And, and for us, just looking at what social action is, um, we, we've been really clear in Empathy Lab work that we support a model that's not just around charity. It's about moving into a much deeper engagement with people with social issues. So they focus on understanding and challenging injustice and inequality. And we, with all of our books, we, we produce stories, not all of them, but some of them we produce story kits that we provide to schools who are part of our programs. And the story kits provide suggestions for actions. And what we've discovered is that the schools will take them much further than we will. I think we're quite mini mouthed about what we suggest just to be on the safe side, but schools know their communities and they know how far they can go. So we've had schools where people have written letters to their MP about the treatment of refugees and, and so on. They've actually really engaged with issues through the medium of the book. It's not about being kind to people, it's about standing in solidarity with them. Oh, the screen stopped moving on, Mike. Oh, thank you. Oh, put it back a bit. Let's just go back a bit away. Yeah, so, so this screen is actually, we, uh, we've got colleagues in the Global Learning Programme, and they gave us this, which I know you can't see it, but the, the summary is, on, is on, in the bigger text on the, the side, which talks about not charity, but social justice and equality for all, and not just caring, but solidarity. And not just about survival, but promoting structural change and not one of helping, but for, for supporting self-reliance and self-determination and not imposing change, but negotiating change. And that's it's not easy when you're working with primary schools, but that's the model we really want to achieve with, with our, through our social action. So how do we build people's empathy? Well, we strengthen their muscles by making helping a part of daily lives. It's important that it's meaningful to people. So doing lo things locally in their communities or in their schools is really important. Uh, opportunities to di direct contact so they can see the results of their action is powerful and keeping it going, not just one off, you know, fundraising for one thing, but keeping it going. And so empathy interaction can start with individual child actions, moving to empathy in the playground and then into the wider community. And books are not just great for great characters that inspire empathy, but they're also brilliant for role modeling social action. And again, I've picked up a few here that I think are just brilliant for role modeling social action. So we've got uh, right from picture books through to books, the second book, like Wonderful Manjeet Man's Wonderful The Crossing, which is around uh, a girl understanding the refugee crisis and understanding the situation and also looking at her brother who's, um, really joined the joined the right and it's become very extreme in his views and we've got Amara in the back the picture book about a little girl who's actually campaigning to bring the bats back to her local park um, there's there are books about children looking at focusing on um, food hunger and food poverty and 
uh, food banks, a kind of spark is by Elmwick Nicol, as is Sarah's Hugh Ra. I didn't realize I put two on there, but that's because I'm a big fan. But a kind of spark is a, is a great book about a girl, an autistic girl who, who actually campaigns to, to create memorials to the witches in her community who were so demonized. And then the rabbit listens, which is, I don't know if you know the rabbit listens, we promote this book in secondary schools. It's, it's, it's a very early picture book, but it's just so brilliant for demonstrating the power of empathetic listening because little boy knocks his tower of bricks over. He's really, really upset. All these other animals come along and suggest what he should do about it. But the rabbit just comes and sits by him and listens to him. And that's the most powerful thing of all. So books are great for role modern empathy. Um, we have, uh, as part of our schools program, Empathy Awards, where children nominate, read, read lots of books and then nominate the characters who show most empathy. So this was a Welsh school who had an Empathy Awards for Empathy Day and nominated uh, or voted the winner, Alexa from the boy in the back of the class as their, um, for their Empathy Awards. Just quickly to tell you about Empathy Day, it happens every year. So um, I think we're settling at the moment on the 8th of June, 2023. Uh, we're just gathering together ourselves after this year's Empathy Day. It's usually a day long festival, usually online so that schools can live stream it, um, but it's accompanied by events and the run up to Empathy Day and also toolkits to help schools and public libraries and anyone else really take part in Empathy Day. And the final thing we do for any empty day is I invite everyone to make an empty resolution. So um, we encourage schools, libraries, anybody in the community to make their resolution. And this year we're going to revisit those uh, resolutions in November. So we're going to have an empty reflection class where we get everyone to think about, did I keep my resolution? What did I do? Or should I remake it now? Or should I make a new resolution? So that will be something to look out for in November. Um, here are a few people doing empathy at events um, during empathy days. Um, we have a, a team of empathy building publishers of which publishers here today are part. And this was one of our empathy building publishers, Nosy Pro, who have an empathy hour on empathy day where they give their staff an hour off to go and do something for the community. And these are two of the, our uh, Nosy Pro colleagues going off to give blood during the empathy hour. Um, and here are some empathy resolutions from uh, some schools that are just on Twitter. Uh, the little boy who's holding up his poster, it says, try not to accuse people. So I don't know what he's been doing, but he's making a resolution not to do it anymore. Here's a high school with their empathy resolution. And some more empathy resolutions. Rather, this was actually writing letters to refugees. And my last thing really wanted to say was that books themselves can create social action. So I don't know if you remember the the issue around Simon James Green, the author, being prevented from uh, a class, a school visit, and because of, because, of, because of the book that he'd written. And actually, secondary schools around the country really responded to that. And I don't know if any of you were part of that, but this, this was a Dulwich, Dulwich school responding by, they were all promoting an LGBTQ book, um, one, one a day during June. And just as on the run up to empty day, we spotted this one coming through, uh, Felix Ever After, which is one of the ones books in our Read for Empty collection. So we were really supporting, supporting that promotion of books and saying these books need to be read. We need to be able to talk about these books. So book uh, social action in themselves. And, and that's it from me. But if you're interested in knowing more about empty love, do, do get in touch and we'll, we'll share more information. Thank you so much, Sarah. I think we'll be popping those links down in the chat as well so people can access them there. Um, so inspiring. Thank you for sharing your absolutely vast knowledge on the subject. It's fascinating. I'm really interested. There's lots of new pieces of information there for me personally. Um, uh, the fact that knowing empathy is a learnable skill um, impacts um, level of empathy that people show and also that that impact of that transportation into a story affecting people's behavior afterwards i think that's really interesting and also some really fascinating uh, book recommendations my to be read pile has definitely grown from <laughs> your i don't know whether to thank you or not for that <laughs> um i've got a question here um just around so we've got this nice mix of public librarians school librarians teachers here today um what opportunities do you do you think there are for public libraries and schools to work together around the promotion of empathy and social action 
Um, loads, because obviously I think that we, we, it works best if it's a whole community thing and it's not, it just shouldn't be something that happens in school or in a library. It's great if the, the school, the library and the family all working together makes for a really powerful empathy message. And obviously public, public libraries can actually promote what the schools are doing in their community so they can engage that intergenerational mix of people and they can promote it to the wider community. So for Empathy Day, we do, you know, lots of schools actually have class visits to their local library. This year, one of the activities that we had as part of our Empathy Superpower Challenge in the run-up to Empathy Day was one around, was, was one around um, the superheroes in your community. So celebrating superheroes in communities and encouraging schools to research who in their community were doing amazing things and creating displays that then could be displayed in the library and you know that the actual superheroes could be invited into the library to meet with the meet with the classes and um, in previous years we've had um, libraries working with local schools and local refugee um, refugee organizations so that they were library public libraries were facilitating children meeting refugees and talking to them about what you know what their experiences were and even things like, you know, local schools, children coming in from local schools to meet the knit and natter group. It's that, again, it's that sort of human discovery thing, isn't it? And using the human library and, and just connecting. So older and younger people connecting safely in a library space is, is powerful. So I think there's loads of opportunities for, for public libraries, because I always think of public libraries as the sort of ultimate empathy engines in communities yeah. to, to meet with schools, to work with children. Um, and, and to build real connections that are, that are founded on empathy between schools and libraries. I, th I love that idea of doing a class visit on Empathy Day almost as that sort of launching off point, but then being able to continue the way in which you interact with your mm -hmm. public library around empathy throughout the year as well. Um, I had a question around, we've seen um, a, a real emphasis um, building up over the last few years and definitely an emphasis um, this year um, around uh, the need for schools and also public libraries to start engaging um, people around the issues of climate change and the environment. Mm. And I just wondered how you thought that came into to work around empathy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because quite a lot of the schools that we've worked with are, are actually looking at making a focus empathy for the environment, because I think it, it does connect them. And, and there is the whole thing around um, climate justice as well. And, you know, looking at looking at the climate, climate change in, in a very holistic um, way in terms of the fact that it's about, again, it's about power and privilege as well as about climate. And, and the fact that the people who are the most affected by climate change are the people that cause it the least, if you see what I mean. So, yeah. so I think um, public, public libraries and schools or, and books really is, is a way of, con you know, you, 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 can, you can really engage in those debates using the books, I think, is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. So even very simple books, um, are like, like Amara and the Bat that we talked about earlier, or a book like Last, which is about the last rhinoceros, can really, really engage in, in, really, in, in really deep debates. And, and I think, you know, the way, that, I mean, there are some authors as well who are so brilliant, I think like Nicholas Davis, for example, who really, you know, they, they, are, they write in such an emotive way that you really, really stir emotions and I think one of the ways in which behavior change happens is if you're really really emotionally connected with what's going on so I think there's an absolute connection between empathy and 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 climate change and and, and behavior change as well which is most important yeah yeah there's the, yeah I think you're right there's so many there's potential so many opportunities there with with books and reading as the starting point mm. but the actually the impact is so much wider um in our in into our communities um thank you so much Sarah we're just coming to the end of our session today um so I'm just going to wrap up and say a huge thank you to all of our speakers um and to those of you who are watching and have put questions into the chat um, Nabila, if you're there still, please do turn your camera back on and so that we, so that you can be included in the thank you too. Um, I know that Jess has had to leave before the end of the webinar, um, but we would love to know, I'm sure all of all of the speakers would love to know if anybody watching today puts this into practice um, and and goes on to, to, to run something similar within their community. So please do let us know. Um, you can contact us on the World of Stories um, 
email address, which hopefully I didn't warn Mike, but maybe he'll be able to find it and put it in the chat in time. Um, if not, we'll include that on, our, on the email of the recording that we send around. Um, uh, we'll also send out the slides from today's session. Um, and I also wanted to point you in the direction of um, a report. Sarah, this is Sarah's second webinar with the NLT this week. Um, <laughs> she's also was involved um, through her Libraries Connected role. Um, we released a report that examines the role of, of of public libraries in raising the literacy skills of children um, whose learning has been disrupted by the pandemic and that was released earlier this week and there's resources available on the literacy trust website um is it on on, on libraries connected site as well those and there's there's a report and some really useful resources and the report calls for long-term partnerships between libraries and schools and early years providers to ensure that the challenges post pandemic in, in in raising literacy levels um uh, do not persist across generations that, that we deal with it in a joined up way um, so it's great for us also to be in a room together virtual room together today um, uh, to start strengthening those connections um, I'm glad to say that we do aim to run this series again in the next academic year with new content um, different lenses um, of focus that we're going to look through um, and so we will also be circulating a, a, a survey with uh, the recording and the minute um, and the slides from today so please do use that to feedback because your feedback will go directly into into the process of us developing what we're going to, to do next year. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, have a good evening. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.